Good morning, Mary Swanson, and I'm going to give you an overview of what you're going to be covering in Laboratory 1, which deals with geologic techniques. Most of you probably think of geologists working in the field, going out collecting rock samples or measuring structures or uh, measuring samples uh, that you uh, need uh, for your field work. But the truth of the matter is that a lot of our work is done in the laboratory or done in the office. And we do a lot of work before we even go in the field. And a lot of that work involves interpreting topographic maps, looking at uh, remote sensing images, looking at satellite images, aerial photos, and uh, doing a whole bunch of work before we actually even arrive at our field site. Um, and so for today, what we want to do is give you an overview of how we use these different techniques and how to interpret maps and how to interpret uh, imagery to tell us information about things we might observe on the ground uh, or facilitate or help us uh, with constructing our geologic maps. Uh, the two images you see here are examples of these uh, uh, techniques or images that you're going to look at today in the lab. The one on the right is a topographic map. Uh, we're going to spend a great deal of time uh, teaching you about to uh, topography and topographic maps and how to interpret them. The one on the left here is a LIDAR image. And you can see the beautiful colors on that and what those actually represent are changes in elevation. So there is some data that overlaps between the two, but you can clearly see there are some differences uh, between the topographic map and the LIDAR image. And so what we want you to be able to do is to know what those differences are and know when uh, you would need to use each of these types of images for your particular work. Uh, I would first like to introduce maps. Uh, most of you are familiar with maps. Maps are two-dimensional representations of a portion of the surface of the Earth, or in the case of a globe, it can be the entire surface of the Earth. I refer to these as planometric representations. That's a term we use for uh, these two-dimensional maps. And they can convey all kinds of different information. I mean, clearly a map like this of Washington State, you've got nominal information like city names. You've got landforms like rivers and mountains. Uh, clearly, you can see uh, international borders. You've got transportation routes, the highway showing up there. So there's a whole range of information that can be conveyed on a map. And, you know, different kinds of maps can convey different time, kinds of information. And so uh, you're, no, you're going to need to know what map you might need for your particular use. Now, maps have been around for a long time. Uh, if these two slides here show you some very ancient maps. The one on the left, uh, shown on this clay tablet, is an ancient Babylonian map that was constructed in 500 B.C. And it shows you the Babylonian world. Now, of course, a lot of this is based on sort of picture images, and so without having knowledge of their language, you would not be able to make uh, much uh, headway of trying to interpret this. But the Roman map is a little bit closer to what you would perceive as a map similar to today. Of course, the perspective is a little bit different, but information-wise, you can actually recognize some of the things shown on this map that was constructed in 20 AD. Uh, you can recognize the continent of Europe, Asia, and Africa uh, shown here. And you'll note here that in the center is the Mediterranean Sea, which really was that very important navigation uh, area for the Romans, for trade and, and commerce, and, of course, for conquering other nations. Now, the maps that we want to focus on are topographic maps. And uh, they're very important to geologists because they convey three-dimensional information uh, as far as the Earth is concerned. Not only do we have all the location data, Okay, with the Latin longitude, and which we'll discuss briefly, and, and uh, how we locate ourselves on this map. And uh, there's the nominal information as far as uh, location-wise, city names. You've got street tra and other transportation routes and so forth. But what's important about these topographic maps are the contour lines that represent, they represent elevation. And so it's really important that you have a very thorough understanding of contour maps and how we use them, what information can be conveyed by them. And, uh, you know, this is not only important for geology, but anyone that hikes, it's really important for you to know which hiking route you want to take, where, how steep the topography is, what areas might be dangerous, and so forth. Now, when you look at the contour maps in the laboratory, there are some major components that you need to be familiar with. Uh, clearly, location. You need to be able to locate yourself on the map. And uh, location, we utilize a geographic grid. Uh, there are different types of geographic grid. You're probably most familiar with latitude and longitude, which I'll give you a brief overview of. There are other geographic grids, such as public land survey, 
which is known as the Township and Range uh, Coordinate System. I'm not going to discuss that now in, in this, in, in this uh, overview, nor do we do much work uh, with it in the laboratory. But we give you nice, detailed accounting of it in case you want that information. Anyone going to work for tax assessors or work for real estate, you'll probably want to be familiar with that coordinate system. Also, map scale. We want to know what the map scale is because the map scale is crucial uh, to understanding what uh, is the representation of the map compared to the surface of the Earth. All maps have a scale. Okay? We know that the map is not the same area, surface area of the area it's representing. So you have to know what that map scale is. And so we'll talk about uh, that component. Uh, another component is the magnetic declination. You know, all, you know, most of your highway maps don't show magnetic declination because you're not really concerned exactly with the, the absolute location. You're more concerned with, uh, if you will, comparative locations, taking this highway to go there and so forth. But if you're actually hiking or you're out working in the wilderness, you need to know the magnetic declination. And the magnetic dec declination represents the angular difference between true north, which is the axial north, the north pole, and the magnetic north, which are not the same points on the surface of the Earth. So that angular difference is the magnetic declination. It needs to be reported on the map so you can compensate for that when you are setting your compasses for your uh, work. The final are the contour lines themselves. These topographic maps, they uh, have contours that display the elevation data. You need to know how to interpret those, and you need to know uh, how those contours are, are placed on the surface of the map and what they represent. So we will spend uh, some time with discussing that, and you'll be working with them. Now, the first thing I mentioned is about the geographic coordinate system, the geographic grid and latitude and longitude. Uh, this diagram here, this is a, a globe, and we've got a little cutout here, shows you that the lines of latitude, if you're looking at them, they uh, trend, okay? If you're looking at them, they show angular distance uh, from north to south, the starting point being the equator. The equator is at zero degrees, and it basically separates the northern hemisphere from the southern hemisphere. So the equator is halfway between the North Pole and the South Pole. The lines of latitude represent angular distance north and south okay, of the equator. And up here we're at 90 degrees. And 9 degrees south would be beneath here, and you can't see that. Uh, there are a couple other latitude lines that are significant here. You can see the dashed line here that continues. Okay, I just drew that in. That is at 23 and a half degrees north. And then over here, you can see on the south side, you have 23 and a half degrees south. And so these are your significant latitude lines. These represent your tropics. Okay, the bottom one in the south, I really shouldn't say bottom, but by our northern convention, we can say that, is the Tropic of Capricorn. The one up here to the north is the Tropic of Cancer. There's a few other lines here. This line right that you see here, okay, is at 66 and a half degrees north, is the Arctic Circle. There's a corresponding circle below, which you don't see here, which is the Antarctic Circle, which is at 66 and a half degrees south. Another important thing to note about lines of latitude, so we have these significant lines of latitude, is that they are parallel to one another. And what that means is the distance between a given angular okay, distance of latitude is going to be the same. Uh, a general overview is about one degree of latitude uh, equals about 70 miles, okay, in distance. Now, I mentioned these significant lines of latitude because uh, I really feel it's important that students have a, a nice overview or an understanding of the why the Earth has seasons. Uh, and it turns out that the seasonal distribution of heat energy from the sun is related, if you will, to uh, these special lines of latitude, the two tropics, uh, the Arctic and Antarctic circles. And all of this comes about is because the Earth is tilted on its axes. It's about, if you look at this, it's about 23 and a half degrees okay, off of being perpendicular. Okay, if you're looking at the Earth being perpendicular to its equatorial plane. So the Earth is tilted on its axis. So in all times here, that axis is always pointing, this is the North Pole, is always pointing towards Polaris, the North Star. 
Now, what's interesting, because the Earth is oriented on its axes, what happens here, as it revolves around the Sun, different parts of its surface are going to be uh, basically impacted by the direct rays of the Sun. At the two equinoxes, spring and fall equinoxes, the Sun's rays are striking directly on the Earth's equator at the equinoxes. At this time here, you know that half the Earth is basically, if you're looking at this, uh, is in this case, uh, the northern and southern hemisphere, both of them are getting equal uh, hours of sunlight and darkness on the equinoxes. That's 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of darkness. Now what happens here, as the Earth revolves around the sun, you'll note here that the orientation of the Earth, because of the axial tilt, is going to, during the winter solstice, the one in December, is going to put the Tropic of Capricorn, 23 and a half degrees south, being struck by the direct rays of the sun. And that's why the southern hemisphere has its summer at that time of the year. It's getting more solar energy because the rays of the sun are more direct. Uh, what you'll note here, which is really clear if you look here, there's the Arctic Circle, right, drawn there. Note that everything poleward of the Arctic Circle is immersed in darkness. So there's 24 hours of darkness on the winter solstice north of 66 and a half degrees north. Now this, the Earth will continue revolving. It'll go through another equinox with 12 hours of daylight and darkness and the sun's rays directly over the equator. It'll continue revolving until we get to the summer solstice. What you'll note here is the sun's direct rays now are at 23 and a half degrees north. And so now the summer, the northern hemisphere gets more solar energy. It warms up. Note that the Arctic Circle, and I can draw it in here, that everything north of the Arctic Circle is immersed in daylight all through the basically 24 hours of the Earth's rotation. And so you get 24 hours of daylight there. So I just wanted to, to, to point this out to you. I think a lot of you already knew this being University of Washington students. Now, if I was given this lecture at Washington State University, then I'd really need to give this lecture because probably no one would understand the seasons. But at UW, I'm just doing it just as a little bit of a review. Now, let's look at this other uh, uh, part of the geographic grid. Those are the lines of longitude. And you'll know the li li excuse me, lines of longitude converge at the North and South Pole. Uh, the other thing that's important to note is you'll say, well, where's the origin? Where do they start? Well, uh, again, many of you are aware that the lines of longitude start at zero degrees. I'm going to darken this so you can see it at zero degrees. And we refer to that line of zero degrees as the prime meridian. It has no real significance in relationship uh, to, you know, an absolute place on the surface of the Earth. The prime meridian runs through the Royal Astro Astronomical Observatory in Greenwich, England. The only reason it runs through there is England was the superpower at the time that we were formalizing this geographic grid, and so that's where zero degrees has been established. Note that the lines of longitude, if you look at them here, uh, note that they converge at the north and south pole. So they all meet at the north and south poles, which means that they're not parallel to one another. They're actually closer together at high latitudes than they are at the equator. And that's important to note, is that they are not uh, parallel to one another. They converge, and so the distances between them are going to change as you change latitude. The other important thing to note here is as you move away from the prime meridian and go 180 degrees, both east and west of the prime meridian, you end up at a point at 180 degrees east and west, which is the international date line. And that's what defines the international date line. It's on the opposite side of the world as the prime meridian. When you cross that, you either lose or gain a day depending what direction you are moving. Okay? Now, it's important to note here, how do you find these on our topographic maps? How is Latin longitude represented here? Uh, clearly, when we come to the topographic map, you're going to see that the Latin longitude are actually shown here. They're down in the very corners of all of the maps here. Okay, you can see in the upper corner, lower corner here. And when we actually look at this, and I'm going to write this up, this is not a map from the laboratory. I took a different map so that we're not giving away all the, all the uh, answers here. I want you to actually work through this, but I want you to understand it. Note that the latitude, this is the southernmost latitude that forms the bounding latitude southerly bounding latitude for this map is 48 degrees, okay? And you'll see that it says zero 
minutes. And now you might say, well, hold it, what does that mean? Well, what happens here, if we're dealing with the Earth, latitude lines and longitude lines are fine. We can use them in degree intervals. But it turns out for you know, smaller areas, one degree of latitude might be too big that basically the area of the map doesn't even cover one degree of latitude and longitude. Therefore, we actually have to have subdivisions for our degrees of latitude. And the one degree of latitude or longitude equals 60 minutes, okay, is the subdivision we use. Okay, so there are 60 minutes in one degree. Now, if you have a really detailed map, we may be looking at even smaller subdivisions. One minute of latitude or longitude equals 60 seconds okay, of latitude and longitude. So that's what those subdivisions represent. So when we say there's, that this is at 48 degrees zero minutes, this means this is at 48 degrees, okay, and that is north, because we're north of the equator. You come up to the top latitude here, okay, and you'll see that its latitude is 48 degrees, 7 minutes, 30 seconds. And so what you'll note here is this represents, okay, this angular distance north of the equator. And so if you're trying to figure out how much angular distance is shown on the map, it's going to be the difference between this, okay, latitude coordinate and this latitude coordinate. So you'll need to figure that out when you look at the maps in, in laboratory, how much angular distance is, shows up on this map. And remember, it's not one degree. It's less than a degree. That's my only hint I'm going to give you. Now, below this here, of course, we have the longitude uh, coordinate shown here. This one here is 122 degrees. 30 minutes, and over here we have 122 degrees, 22 minutes, and 30 seconds. So the same thing here. We've gone from 122.30 uh, to 122 minutes, 30 seconds. So there's a certain angular distance shown here. And so you have to take the larger, okay, here, 122 degrees, 30 minutes, and subtract out uh, 122, 22 minutes, and 30 seconds. Remembering that 30 seconds equals how much of a minute, right? It's going to be one half of a minute. So you can figure that out and do, the, do those calculations uh, at that point there. And so it's very important that uh, when you're looking at these topographic maps that you understand all the data that's being conveyed there. Now, there is other information that we need to look at on these maps. Now, scale, for instance. Scale is shown on the very bottom of the map. And what I've done is I've blown up this section. It's really hard to see if we're trying to zoom in on this to show you where the scale is shown on the map. Uh, in this case here, of uh, the topographic maps, there are two types of scale shown. There is a scale that shows up here as a fraction. This is called a representative fraction. Okay. And uh, on this map, it's 1 to 24,000, which is a common uh, representative fraction for the topo maps that you're going to be looking at. But you're going to be looking at other scales as well. And this is really simple. You'll notice that this is unitless. It doesn't have feet. It doesn't have inches. And all it simply states is that one unit on map equals 24,000 units on Earth. And so that's the scale, 1 to 24,000. And uh, it's important because this scale, you probably heard the term large scale, small scale maps, and we're going to discuss this in, uh, in your laboratory. You'll be working with this. The way to look at your uh, scale, your map, whether it's large or smaller scale, is to just actually turn this into a fraction. So 1 to 24,000 uh, is a fraction. And let's say you're looking at a map uh, maybe you're looking at a world map. That might be one to or one to one million, and so you can clearly see which is the smaller scale map. Just ask yourself which is the smaller fraction. Is one 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 millionth smaller or one to twenty one twenty four thousand smaller? Well, clearly it's one to one millionth, and so you need to ask yourself which is going to show more land area, which is going to show more detail. The other scale that's shown here, and with this blue arrow, is what we refer to as the graphic scale. And that's sometimes referred to as a bar scale. That's important because you can actually take a ruler on the base of your topo map, measure the bar scale, and then use that 
to calculate you know, how many miles, how many feet, how many meters, kilometers represent an inch or a given unit of measurement on your ruler. Then you can go to your map, measure distances on it, and you can very quickly calculate how far cities are apart or mountain ranges apart or so forth. Okay, so this graphic or bar scale is important for actually you doing applied work on the map. The last uh, scale, which is uh, not shown here, is a nominal scale, and that is a naming scale. And we don't see that on these maps, but you'll see it on some maps. That would be if they actually put one inch equals five miles. So it's actually written out, and some maps will actually show that. Okay, and that's your, that's your your written scale. So you'll be working with scale uh, when you actually get uh, and look at those maps. Now, the third component is the magnetic declination. Magnetic declination, as I mentioned uh, in previous lectures, the magnetic field or the magnetic pole is not coincident with the geographic pole. So the North Pole, the true North Pole, and the magnetic pole are not the same points. And so what that means is when you're on the surface of the Earth, that when you point your compass and you have a compass, the compass needle is going to point to magnetic north. And it will not be pointing to true north except for in a couple instances. In the case here, if you were down in Florida, for instance, you can see that this dashed red line actually lines up. Everything on this line lines up okay, between the magnetic north and true north. So that's one place where, or one line where they do line up. But for most everywhere else in the United States over here, you're either some degrees east or west of true north. And so it's important on your map that you know what your magnetic declination is. That way, when you're using your map for hiking, you can set your compass to compensate for the magnetic declination so that whenever your compass points to magnetic north, you've offset the dial on it to actually have it pointing to true north. And so it just makes it a lot more easier when you're hiking or, or trying to find your way home uh, that you know where true north is. Okay. Now, the final component we want to address here are the contour lines themselves. Uh, topographic maps, as we mentioned earlier, uh, show topography. And how we show topography on a two-dimensional representation is we use contour lines. And so this block diagram down here shows you topography. You can see a couple of rivers and you can see uh, some uh, hills here. And you can very quickly see how these are conveyed uh, on the topographic map. In the case of the hills here, you can see these sort of round, if you will, these concentric uh, uh, contour lines that represent that topography. You can see here in the rivers, you can see that the, the contour lines, and you'll notice this sort of familiar pattern of the river that the, the contour lines actually V upstream uh, with that river. There's a number of uh, important points about contours. I don't want to go through all of them. You can read about them in the, in the lab there. Some very key points about them. They represent points of equal elevation. So a contour line is going to be a certain elevation point. Uh, another important point is they, they, don't, they will not uh, cross. They can't cross, right? Because they represent specific elevations. Uh, unless in some cases you've got special things like when you have a an overhang of a cliff, you can have situations where uh, contour lines uh, may cross one another, but you'd show that as a dash line because of an overhang cliff. But for most topography, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, the other thing is that uh, is often is they will not, uh, if you see they will not, uh, cl they always will close in on themselves unless you reach the end of the map there. And you'll see here where they just end because, of course, there's nothing being uh, shown here on the map. So just keep that in mind. Uh, that's the only time you're just going to see a contour line. It won't, a contour line would not end just in the middle of a map, right? It's got you know, to close in on the topography, surround it, okay, of that same elevation. Uh, the other important thing to note here, so I showed you how rounded hills are shown here, right, where we have, a, if we were to show a rounded hill, here with, with, with contour lines, that heel would look something like that maybe, okay, and showing the contour lines around it. Uh, if we have close depressions, like a, you know, you might have a situation like this with a meteor crater, okay, and you want to show that topography there, you do the same kind of lines except you'll show hashers in them. So that's important you note that, that uh, within a closed depression you use hashers. So this contour here might be 200 feet, and that one might be 100 feet, showing that it's going down in elevation. Uh, the last thing that I've already mentioned here is that when you look at rivers, contour lines will V up drainage. So we, have, we call this the rule of Vs, okay? And so those are sort of the important, uh, you know, highlights of what you'll need to know for, for contour lines.
Okay? So once we look at topography and we look at our contour maps, there's certain things you can calculate. There's information that uh, you can convey from that. Uh, part of this information is, is slope. You want to know what the, how steep something is. You, know, you want to hike a mountain. Is it something that's too much for your grandparents to work? Or maybe you want to put a, a road in or a railroad in. Uh, and then so clearly we need to know what the slope is. And that is simply calculated as the rise of the run. Uh, in this case here, and this is showing an 80-foot uh, change in vertical elevation of relief over an 800-foot horizontal distance. So you just take the rise over the run, that's going to give you, a, in this case here, a ratio of 0.10, and you can convert that to a slope, excuse me, a percent slope, if you like. That's a 10% slope. Okay, so you'll be doing those calculations. Just remember, it's very simple. Uh, gradient is diff slightly different from slope. Uh, gradient represents the difference of elevation in a unit like feet, uh, over a horizontal distance. In this case here, if it's English units, it'll be feet uh, per mile. If it's metric units, it might be meters per kilometer. And uh, in that case here, let's just use an example. Uh, the example you use in the laboratory, let's say that you have a point over here, okay, that is at 182 feet above sea level, and a point over here, 118 feet, excuse me for the poor writing, 118 feet above sea level. And let's say that we're trying to come up with a gradient. And let's say what we're really looking at here, let's say that there's a stream that's flowing along that. Okay, and so you have a, a meandering stream, okay, flowing down there. And so that's the elevation between the two points in the stream. Well, what you want to do here is you're going to need to get a string because if you're dealing with land, you might use a straight line. But for a, a stream gradient, you actually have to measure the distance in the channel. So you'll take a piece of string and line it up in the entire channel. And then you're going to take that string, you'll straighten it out after. And let's say it turns out to be, in this case, 1.8 miles. And you know that the elevation difference is 182 and 118 feet. Well, that's going to represent 64 feet okay, per 1.8 miles. Well, that's not good enough. We actually want to bring that down to a standard U, and we want that down to feet per mile. So you just take your 64 feet, divide it by 1.8, and you're going to end up with 35 feet per mile. So you've got your gradient, and you'll work with that in the laboratory today. Okay? Now, the last thing I want to talk about that you're going to be doing, and uh, your TAs will help with this because I can't show you all this uh, on my PowerPoint here, is how to complete a topographic cross-section. What you're going to be dealing with today is we're going to have uh, you look at the Icicle Creek uh, and Wenatchee River drainages, which are near Leavenworth, Washington. One was glaciated, one was not glaciated. It was uh, incised by a river. They have very different profiles. And so what you're going to need to do is, again, to save time, we're going to have each group do one profile, and you'll share your information. And so we put the profiles on the map. I think we actually have them labeled on the map as AA or BB, depending which one you're going to work on. And then you're going to take that profile, and it's going to go across that stream, that stream drainage. And so what you want to do is you want to get a little sheet of paper, and you're going to take that sheet of paper and line it up along the cross-section line. And then what you're going to do is you're going to record the elevation data from the contours. Now, what I really want to stress here is on these, some of these uh, maps, you have very detailed contours. The contours may be really close together. I don't want you trying to record every contour you see. Just take the index ones, the thicker ones, and you'll see typically when we look at a contour map, you're going to see uh, typically the thicker ones. These are the index contours. And then there's going to be some smaller, thinner ones in between there, and those represent the actual contour interval. On the base of your map, if you go back to your, uh, your uh, topographic map, you'll see right below the bar scale is the contour interval. And so in the case of this map I have here on Woodby Island, the contour interval is 20 feet. So what that means is there's 20 feet between each of these contour lines. So that's 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. So that might be 100 feet, and that one might be 200 feet, the two index ones. So I really want you, when you do this cross-section, don't try to get every contour. Just get some of the representative ones. Once you get all that data down, you're going to make a graph. Okay, You're going to have an X and a, and a Y axis. The Y axis is going to be elevation. And what you're going to want to do here, when you look at the, when you look at the elevation is you're going to have it reflect what the elevation is shown on your contour map of what elevation units are on your particular cross-section line. So in this case here, we were looking at elevations that range between 800 
and 1,000 feet. That can cover everything that we were measuring on this particular cross-section line. And so that's what's reflected in your y-axis. Over here on your x-axis, you line up your piece of paper, keeping your, your, uh, your cross-section units the same. So in this case here, we might have had, if this was A on this side and that was A over here, then we would put A, A prime over here, keep that paper lined up, move it up and down, and put in on your elevation, put in the actual elevation points. And don't move this right or left. Okay, keep it going straight up and down. And then what's going to happen here is you're going to end up with a contour uh, profile, if you will, a you know, cross-sectional profile of whatever you were mapping. Okay, so that gives you an overview of what we're going to be covering in lab this week. I know this is a little bit long. Uh, I can assure you this will probably be the longest lecture I ever do, but there's a lot of new information that you guys may not have and that I did not lecture on in lecture. So please take your time, work through the lab. You now have the background. Do well, and I will see you next week when we talk about uh, plate tectonics. Okay, good luck and have fun.